everyone, this is Dr. Tram Nguyen. Welcome back to Medical Care Redefined. And this is Lan. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, so today we wanted to discuss something called hormone imbalance. So one of the reasons why I admire Dr. Nguyen so much is as a physician, she truly, really cares about optimizing her patient's health. And as a family physician, she saw that there are a lot of patients who have hormonal imbalance that didn't even know it. And so she became specialized in it and spent a lot of time investing into this topic so that she was able to um, help her patients overcome this imbalance and help them live a healthier life. So today we wanted to talk about that so that we can bring some knowledge to everyone else and let our patients know that we're here for them. Um, so I feel like hormonal imbalance doesn't necessarily mean uh, people with postmenopausal, right? So when do women necessarily feel hormonal imbalances or start having the experience of it? So they, um, they can actually have imbalance feeling a lot earlier than menopause, so generally around the menstrual period. Now, somebody who has PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome, they can have it symptoms since their teenage years. So okay. that's when they may have experience of like acne, uh, facial hair, obesity, that can't lose weight, and they have irregular menstrual period. That's imbalance from uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome. And then when they kind of get into the menstrual period time, um, those who have estrogen dominance, which means that the, the uh, patient has produced too much estrogen and not enough progesterone. So those patients, they tend to get really moody in that time of the month or they get really sad or really anxious um, around the menstrual period time. Um, then you're usually very bloating uh, because their the progesterone is not balanced with the estrogen. So that can occur. Um, and then there's times where people who are on birth control for a long time, even though they haven't hit menopause at 40 or 50 yet, but in their 30s, they start to have decrease in testosterone level because they were on oral birth control for so long. Uh, then it can decrease um, their testosterone level, which then have they will um, have symptoms of decreased libido, feeling fatigued or tired very easily, and then weight resistant, where they um, if the testosterone level is low, they have less muscle mass, but a lot of adipose tissue deposit, especially in the central obesity area. So that could be in symptoms of early hormone imbalance in early menopausal state. What about males? Do they typically have hormonal imbalance? Uh, they can't. So in males who are not in the andropause state, meaning they're not um, at that age where their testosterone level decreases, like women, the hormones imbalance. Um, in in younger males, some of them will have lower testosterone just because they don't produce enough, and that um, could be from the the brain not producing enough GnRH, which is um, the the stimulating hormone to go into the testosterone uh, to the uh, uh, the testicle to produce testosterone. So they may have low testosterone. So those guys will be more skinny. They don't have as much uh, muscle mass. They'll be more tired, and then they will have low sex drive and they have more adipose tissue deposit and their fertility is also very decreased. They don't have um, as much sperm production because their testosterone level is low. Wow, okay. So let's walk everyone through like what we do for our patients. Um, how do you as a provider identif identify that a patient might have hormone imbalance when they step into our clinic? So um, it depends on at what age they're in. So hormone imbalance, like for, for example, estrogen in postmenopausal women will cause them, or uh, in postmenopausal women who have like low testosterone, low estrogen, and low progesterone. So they can come in and have symptoms like uh, feeling uh, anxious, forgetful, they don't remember where they left their keys, or they're just not as clear. Um, they can't focus with their work. Um, they're having hot flashes, they can't sleep well. Um, or their their energy levels decrease. They have troubles losing weight. They can't. They they've done everything and they can't lose weight. And same with men. If they are saying their libido is low, the energy level is bad. They can't sleep well. Um, they're they're having issues relations with their significant others. Um, those are all signs that we would need to check their hormones. Um, as for women, sometimes they just come in and say, hey, I have depression, I have anxiety, and that's something that depending on what age group they're in, I might consider checking their hormones. Sometimes they truly do have depression and anxiety, and that's generally like when they, their family has a history of that, or if they've had that for many years since they were younger, but if it's a new onset and they're 40 years old and just now having these symptoms, then I may consider checking their hormones. 
So because Dr. Wynn um, truly wants to help optimize everyone's health, these services that we're mentioning here for hormonal imbalance, it's offered to everyone even um, if they're a member or not member at DPC Health. So I know that a lot of listeners probably don't have access to DPC Health or Dr. Wynn. So Dr. Wynn, what do you recommend for someone if they're trying to find a provider for hormonal therapy? What should they look for and what should they expect? So they need to look for a physician who truly understands hormone therapy um, and actually studies in the, the new the new era of, of hormone therapy, especially bioidentical hormones, right? So um, when I was in residency, I remember uh, I didn't I didn't know anything about hormone therapy. And one of the things that I remember my attending was telling me was don't give them hormone therapy. It causes cancer and blood clots. And so if any of your patient is on estrogen or whatever, try to taper them down. But, if, you know, you try to do that on a patient who is suffering from, from menopause, it sucks for them. So would never, I, it, I was trying to do that and it was really hard until I finally understand hormone, took a lot extra courses in bioidentical hormone understanding. So if we go to a physician, if you go, you go to a physician that doesn't understand hormone therapy, they may give you oral estrogen. And oral estrogen, for example, um, can increase the risk of breast cancer and blood clots because it has a component. So estrogen breaks down the three categories. So I'll try to explain it real simply. There's E1, E2, and E3. So E1 binds to the receptor that increases the risk of breast cancer and blood clots. And then E2 is kind of neutral, and then E3 is actually cancer protective. So uh, when we do replacement, sometimes I'll use more E3 and E2, but I don't ever use E1. So never I, that I prescribe oral um, estrogen for, for, for hormone replacement unless the patient's been on it a long time and they really can't get off of it. Sometimes like I really try to convince them to get off of it because of that risk. And then also doctors who doesn't understand hormones sometimes will give too much. Um, for example, testosterone, right? If you go to a, like a, T center, testosterone center, um, that just kind of give injections without monitoring the levels. They may give you know, the men a lot of energy and a lot of muscles, but then when you have too much testosterone and not monitoring the lab work can increase the risk of strokes and heart attack because then they're causing too much of the blood thickness and then it can also um, cause testicular shrinkage and also decrease in fertility. So things like that, um, if we don't, the, the physicians or the providers not knowing what they're doing could cause harm to the patient if they're not going to the right physician. Yeah, that, that uh, so just be careful, right? So make right. sure that you're looking for somebody who's um, certified and knows what they're doing. Now, what about, um, what are some symptoms that patients should be looking for if they, they think they have hormonal imbalance? So we mentioned that depression and anxiety might be factors that, you know, you thought that it was a something that you gained, but it really is because of the hormonal imbalance. What are other symptoms that patients might feel? So in females, you can get like uh, very moody, uh, forgetfulness, uh, like I've mentioned. Um, if you're losing your, um, you're starting to kind of change your menstrual period time, then you're looking for sleep. If you're not sleeping well, you wake up at night, night sweats, um, decrease in libido, uh, vaginal dryness, uh, thinning of the skin, aging. Uh, those are, are all symptoms of that. And estrogen plays like 400 functions. So uh, when we have low in that case, it can cause a lot of issues. And then also, like I said, for testosterone being low, it can also cause you to have weight resistant. You're trying to do everything you can, eating right, exercising, doing everything that you're supposed to do and you're still not losing weight. That's also a sign. And as for men, um, uh, some of the similar symptoms is you have an increase in adipose tissue deposit, especially around the central obesity and the abdomen area. And then your muscle mass is like shrinking. If you can kind of like see some of the older men, if you've ever seen them, they're kind of like thin on their arms and their legs, but they kind of got a big belly. We always call it a beer belly, but really it's, it's some of it is from the beer drinking, but some of them don't drink beer and they still have it, is because the testosterone level is low and that's causing um, that feature in the body. And then it usually will have a lot of decrease in energy and then the libido is, is, is very horrible. So those are some of the symptoms that it would have. So um, something that I know you've mentioned before was like if you, it links somehow to Alzheimer's, right? So like, uh, can you tell us more about that? How do you? Yeah, so for um, estrogen is actually a really important function for memory uh, for women. Right, so women who has low estrogen will have an increased risk of an Alzheimer's and dementia. 
they're doing some studies right now that using estrogen to help patients who actually has dementia to help improve the, the memory. And same thing with men, when their testosterone level is low, they also increase the risk of dis dementia and, and Alzheimer's. And so that, that's the new era of medicine that's being studied right now. And some are being tested on the patients and they're doing pretty well with the replacement. Okay, so moving on to like treatment wise, I know for a fact here at DPC Health we use bioidentical hormones. Um, so can you explain the difference between bioidentical hormones and synthetic hormones? So synthetic hormones like oral estrogen, uh, Premarin, a lot of the, uh, you guys might hear of those. Those are um, kind of used from like uh, equine, so like horse hormones. Um, so those are not um, those are not bioidentical. So the word bioidentical meaning do we try to make the hormone that looks just alike our hormone. Okay. Um, so that is better for us than using horse hormone um, like the equine like I mentioned earlier E3 has increased risk of cancer. Mm -hmm. So I don't like um, using um, uh, synthetic hormones in that case and then same thing with the um, testosterone for example uh, oral testosterone will increase the risk of testic I mean uh, liver cancer so I don't like using um, oral testosterone either so it's either cream injections or pellets yeah so let's talk more about the different types of hormone we, uh, hormone therapy we offer here at DPCL uh, so let's start with injections how does that usually work so if the patient decides to use injection as a replacement, generally men will get these. Uh, so the testosterone injection, the testosterone uh, is very thick. So use a, a thicker needle, but do you, we, um, either the patient can inject themselves or if they're kind of concerned, they always bring, uh, bring it here. Our nurse can do the injections for them. Um, it's usually like one, once a week or twice a week. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, bi-weekly, no, I'm sorry. Take that back it's every two weeks or once a week and sometime if some patients won't require it more than you could sometime bi-weekly um, those are injectable intramuscular so it's in their thigh or in the glute um, area and then what about creams i know we have some compounding creams that we give patients yeah so cream either for males or females the cream if i use in female i usually combine bias so like i mentioned earlier like e3 and e2 together and if they require um testosterone then i'll make some testosterone in there so the and then for men usually it's just testosterone cream um i usually like uh, to tell them to apply it in their thigh every morning and then no intercourse after after the cream is because it's transdermal. Um, it can be transferred through the skin route. So let's say if you have little kids in the house, probably not a good idea to do cream since like, you know, if they, you hold them on your lap or something, it can transfer. Um, and then also you got to wash your clothes separately with the family members, especially kids, right? So you don't want to, you know, have the cream on the clothes and then the you wash it and the kids will have it on their transfer on their on their skin that would be not so good <laughs> you don't want the kids to have too much estrogen or too much testosterone so that's um that's a cream route it, it works pretty good on most patients some patients the absorption is not that great mm -hmm. so we have to switch them out if if the cream is not for them and then uh, one of the cool things I think for hormonal therapy is pellet insertions because Dr. Wen lets me sit in sometimes to watch her do it. Can you tell us more about pellet insertion? So uh, pellets are another form of delivery of hormone. Um, so generally we would calculate the dose of the pa the dose of the hormone the patient need based on their level and then also their weight. So weight based and and their current level and based on that dose, we then we would put it under the skin. So it's we literally put a little nick in the um, kind of glute area in the love handle kind of area where the the, the fat pad is. Um, we a little nick and then we insert the pellet in. It's tiny. It's like a little grain of sand, uh, grain of uh, rice. And then once it goes in there, we put some skin tape over it after a few days, the the, uh, the, the incision site heal. Then the hormones release slowly, either estrogen um, or testosterone for male or estrogen and testosterone for women. It'll release slowly on the hormones. It lasts between three to six months and it's pretty even, um, even release. Usually take about two weeks to kind of get the effectiveness. If it's a first time a patient have have pellets, sometimes they'll have maybe a little bit of swelling, um, water to retention a little bit, um, but majority of the time is, is very minimal. 
Yeah, and if you're curious on how a pellet insertion works, we actually had a patient that let us film it. So we'll link that video for everyone to watch if you are curious by any means. Um, and I guess for our patients or people listening, why are our pellets more optimal for hormonal therapy compared to the other options? Uh, well, I mean, like I said, I usually like my let kind of display all the options and I let my patient decide what it is that's best for them because I don't know what their situation is financially or or just kind of like um, uh, for, for for easy access so um, I like the pellets a little bit better personally is because the way it's released is because once you, the the pellet comes in it kind of naturally releases and then so unlike the injections for example uh, when the testosterone injections it comes in you have a, a, a peak and then at the end of the injection you'll have a trope so it's like trope and peak so you have that non-even uh, hormone versus the the the, te the pellets is nice and naturally mm -hmm. released like that and then same with the cream you just like have to concern about applying every morning you got to remember that and then you got to make sure you wash your clothes separately so this is the inconveniency um of the of that sometimes patients forget to apply or you know it's just the complication of it so that's the reason why i i prefer the pellets over that because mainly for for patients um uh, conveniency okay cool so a lot of useful information here for anyone who might be interested let us know uh, we're going to go ahead and move on to segment two, where I'm going to read some statements here for Dr. Wynn, and she's going to uh, tell us if it's true or false and elaborate if needed. So the first statement is, estrogen replacement can cause cancer. True or false? That one is true in a sense. Um, if it, they're using, like I've mentioned earlier, if they use um, oral estrogen that has E1 in it, then it can increase. Usually for a patient, we usually will um, have like, mammogram screening anyway prior to do any kind of uh, hormone if they do have like more of a dense breast then i'll tend to lean toward using more e3 because that's more cancer protective and less of the e2 i don't even use e1 anyway yeah. um so uh it can be true if the physician is using oral estrogen yeah okay um and then statement number two you can get acne and grow facial hair if you get testosterone replacement in females um, so true if you get too much. Um, so it depends if a patient, if the physician is not monitoring the level and they're just giving them to, you know, just give them to give them. And they, there's some places that do that. They just don't check levels. Mm -hmm. And when you have too much testosterone, yes, you can have increase in facial hair and acne. But if you treat them adequately because they're low and you're just getting them to the level that they need, that shouldn't be the case. Okay. And then you can have testicular cancer if you get testosterone replacement. So back to the cancer question. Yeah, so um, if, the, if you have a history of testicular cancer or prostate cancer, then no, you don't get, we don't give you testosterone at all. We have to screen that. But if you don't have it, it if the level is, your level is really low, we're just getting you to an adequate dose that should not cause you to have increased risk of cancer. But if you have cancer, it's a contraindication for treatment. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have cancer, because the, technically if you have cancer, the testosterone can increase the growth of the cancer, but it doesn't cause cancer if we treat it adequately. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. You can be sterile if you get testosterone replacement in males. True or false? So that one can be true if it's early. So in males, like I mentioned earlier, some males will have um, low testosterone earlier age. So like if they come to me and they're at 30 and they're having low libido and energy levels bad and stuff like that, I check their testosterone and it's low. I usually don't like to recommend giving the, those male testosterone injection or pellets or testosterone replacement itself. I actually like to use Clomid, for example, to increase the GnRH in the brain that goes to the testicle and increase testosterone production so that actually increased their fertility versus okay. if you do testosterone which is an exogenous testosterone that can decrease sperm count and yes it can cause infertility so usually in male before I treat them with testosterone my question for them is do you still want to have kids if you still want to have kids then I use a different method okay yes yeah, a lot of options out there 
Uh, yes. I hope this is enough useful information for anyone who might think that they have hormonal imbalance or just was curious to see what hormonal therapy was like. We have a questionnaire on our website. If you just click on the podcast, then you can take a look and see whether or not you have any of the symptoms or any of the um, problems that is listed on there. And if you do and you, you want more help or more um, have a bigger conversation about this, you're welcome to call us at DPC Health. And Dr. Wen, do you have any last words? Um... <laughs> I think I covered a lot of things yeah. already, um, but uh, hormone imbalance, uh, hormone balance is actually really, really important. It's not just for you know libido. It's like one of the things we always talk about, but it's also your for your physical health, mental health, right? Mm-hmm. To help with bone density, help taunting of the skin to prevent aging, um, to help with your muscle mass, uh, prevent obesity increased, and it's it's just so so important to have hormone balance. I think that everybody should look into it if you have issues. I think a lot of us just like, okay, it's just aging process. Mm -hmm. But you know, somebody who's in their 50s and they're already having decreased libido, already having issues, you still got another 50 years of your life. You don't Mm -hmm. want to have that 50 years of unhealthiness. So that's what I would say is that if you have issues, I would recommend getting some help, even if it's not from us, from somebody who, who understands hormones. All right. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. See you next week. All right. Bye. Bye. See you guys next week.